All right. Welcome, everyone. I um, I will be doing the talk about PL, PG, SQL control structures. Uh, if there's any confusion, I am your nooblet, uh, just so that you know. All right. Let's get the slides to start. All right. I'm Andreas. I'm a software developer slash code shepherd at Quant Solutions and GoodX Software. We specialize in developing software to manage medical practices, and we use uh, Python and Postgres. Um, my friend Angus, who was here previously, said we uh, we maybe love Postgres a bit too much, and I can I can agree with him. So those are my profiles: my GitHub, my Quora, and my LinkedIn. I have not answered any questions for a while on Quora, but yeah, you can follow me there. Cool. So, so what, if, what is, what is uh, Postgres PL, PG, SQL and functions? Well, the PL, PG, SQL is a procedural language, and uh, that's basically all. Functions encapsulate multiple queries, they and they introduce control structures that can be used to perform complex computations. So a control structure is a block of code that evaluates variables, and then perform certain instructions ba um, in a specific way based on the given parameters. Uh, just a little disclaimer, this is a very introductory course. All right. But in any case, on to the real things. Since uh, Postgres, uh, we have both functions and stored procedures in Postgres, and the difference is that functions they, um, usually have return values when you call them. If such a function does not have a return value, you have to declare it as returning value void, um, whilst procedures don't have to have return value, uh, don't have return values. Functions are also part of a single transaction when you call them, whilst procedures can actually start and end multiple transactions within them. And then there's a difference in the way that you call them when using them inside a query. When you call a function, you can call them with a select operator and with procedures, you use the call uh, keyword. All right. Postgres allows us a lot of languages that we can use to write these functions in. There you can see quite a list, uh, SQL, Python, Java, R, Scheme, SH, and then uh, PLv8 and PL lol code. I would suggest you go and look at lol code if you'd like to have a little bit of a laugh. So, and PLv8 is just a JavaScript engine if you want to add JavaScript to your database. And that is like a little little example of what JavaScript would look like. But why would you even use functions? The reason is that, as I've mentioned, that functions encapsulate multiple queries. And when typically when you query a database, you have to send multiple queries to a database. The query has to, uh, server has to pass the queries, uh, prepare a plan, and then execute them. And when using a function, all those the parsing and the planning all happens in a single step in the database instead of, instead of having multiple round trips between the database client and the database server. Um, there's no intermediate transfer of, no unnecessary transfer of intermediate results. And as I said, you don't pass query results multiple times. It, it, it allows speed and performance. All right, here's an example of a function that you can create in uh, Postgres, it basically just takes two strings and a boolean that says whether you want to uppercase both strings or lowercase them both, and it concats them. And when calling this function, there's a few ways that you can call functions. The first one is the positional notation, which is the traditional way in which people called functions. You call the function and you pass the parameters in the order that they are declared in the function signature. Um, if your function has default parameters, added, such as in this function, you can see that uppercase boolean is default false, you can leave it out and it will use that default value. But you have to start leaving out variables from the end. There's also named notation w by which you can call functions. Um, this allows you to actually use the argument names of the Postgres, of the variables in the signature. And when you use, um, this is done by doing the, the arrow with the equals and the greater than, less than sign, greater than sign. And uh, this allows you to specify arguments in any order that you want. This is especially useful if you have very long 
function signatures with a bunch of optional variables and you would just like to set a few of them. You can also omit arguments but then but this can also only happen from the back. And then a caveat that named notation cannot be used when you call aggregate functions uh, unless it's used in a window function in the current implementation of Postgres. Then after the named notation you can also do the mixed notation where you do both positional and named arguments where your positional arguments are the f initial ones and then you can start naming stuff afterwards. Also the same caveat you can't use them in aggregate functions. Right now returning from a function this is how we get our results. A return statement stops the execution of the function, it returns to the caller with a result. That result can be a scalar or a composite type. So a scalar is just one of your primitive types. Composite would be the row or a record. Uh, if you don't return something, you return void. And functions can also return sets of values. So a set of values is thinking as if I call a function and it returns an entire table to me. Okay. Composite types like rows and records, those are a row is exactly like a table row. You have your types and you know which fields they have. A record is much more uh, variable. There's no fixed structure to a record. And uh, it's just to allow for when you want variable stuff or when you want to actually type check things according to rows. Okay, so how to return? And that's the statement. You return and you give it an expression. That expression is evaluated, the function is terminated, and the result of the expression is returned to the caller of this function. If you return scalar values, that value will be automatically casted to the, to the return type of the function. However, if you have a composite, like a record or a row, you actually have to dis, uh, specify the column set when you return. Um, otherwise, Postgres will not know what your return value will look like. And then it's required in functions, except when you give output parameters or the return type is void. All right. To return sets of... Uh, values, the returning of tables as I've said. You can use return next, return query and the return query execute. Okay, so the, these return statements are all only applicable when you return, when your functions are declared as returning a set of some type. B um, all these statements, they then return the, when you use them, they will actually append the value of the expression or the query to the result set and uh, when you have a final return statement or when the function executes, ugh, exits, uh, that entire result set that you've built up will be returned to the caller. So you can have multiple return next and return query statements but you can't have multiple return statements in a function. Alright, there's a little example of how you return a set of. You can see we're looping, getting for everything in the row just appended to the result set and that final return will actually uh, ex uh, stop executing the function. And here is one where we do the query. This allows you to actually perform a query when returning. So it will perform the query and the results of that will be returned. And this is a nice way to actually check that when you return you can do checks like this one is you can't um, return an empty result set. In any case, then you don't have to, when you call the function afterwards, check for the result set. It's just a little way to encapsulate checks and those types of things. Moving on to conditionals, there's a bunch of statements that you can use. And these are used to execute certain pieces of code based on a condition that you've, um, that you've specified. These are exactly the same as other if statements and if else statements in your other languages that you get. And you can see there's quite, quite a lot. Um, there's one caveat though. In if statements, you don't have something, something like Boolean short-circuiting. So Boolean short-circuiting is when you have a value and you try to evaluate a value and another value. If the first value actually returns as truthy, it will not actually try to evaluate the first one. Ugh. And this one also returns as truth, it will go. But if it gets the first value as false, it won't even try to evaluate the second expression because something and false is always false. So that's Boolean short-circuiting. But in Postgres you don't have that because the query planner will execute the clauses in whichever way it decides uh, would be ben more beneficial to get your results so as quickly as possible. So that makes sense to everyone. <coughs> All right. And uh, this also happens because actually when you do an if statement with an expression, that expression is actually performed by doing a select with the expression in the background. And then, and similarly when you have parameters in your expression, 
Those parameters are initially uh, checked, substituted when the query is performed, and the statement is then cached as a prepared statement in your Postgres server, which allows for better performance and cache rate ratios when you do. And it depends on the mutability of the parameters about how well this works. All right, so here's an example of the basic, basic if. You say if I have a Boolean expression, then do something in if. And uh, that Boolean expression has to return a true or a false. If something returning null is not also um, going to perform as expected. You can also have an else statement. So if something is true, do the statements, else do something else. Or you can, and you can add many, many else if statements to that. This is exactly the same as having nested if else statements. And this allows to have your control flow split into various different branches. Use this. You also have statements such as the case statements. This is the form of the ca simple case statement where you have a case and a single expression. That expression is evaluated once and then success and then you can have multiple when clauses. So for each when clause it will successively compare to the value that was evaluated and if it finds a true, uh, if it evaluates a true, it will execute that code and jump to the end of the case and it will not ret um, evaluate the rest of the statements. In the simple case uh, structure, you can also have an else clause, which is uh, the default clause that will execute. And if you do not have an else clause, and it happens that you don't have a match, a case not found exception will be raised. Unless you, and if you, if you want to have a case and in your default don't do anything, then you have to write an else null or else don't do anything. Um, this is different to when you use a case in a normal query where if there's no default, it will just return null. All right, in PL, PGSQL, it will actually raise an exception. All right, there's also a searched case. Uh, and then you don't have a single value at the top. You can have d various uh, expressions within your when clauses and each one is evaluated in turn. As soon as one of the expressions returns strictly true, uh, it will execute that code and none of the rest of the statements will be expressions will be evaluated. And this is uh, same, it will return a case not found if you don't have an else and it does not find a truth value. All right. Moving on, we have also have looping structures in our Postgres. The most basic one would be the normal loop statement. And uh, this is an unconditional loop. It will always just continue looping until, you ha until it encounters an, a return or an exit statement or, yes, a return or an exit statement. And then you can add labels there to uh, jump to with your continue and your exit statements if you want. So your exit statement looks like that and your continue statement like that. When you specify a label, it will actually try to jump to that label. And uh, this is uh, the same as go to and break statements that you would usually find, uh, continue and break statements you would find in your C and your uh, C++ and those types of languages. Um, this will break the innermost loop unless an exit is in a begin and an end block, then it will actu actually only exit from that block and continue with the statements from then on. Uh, but if you have it inside a begin and end block, it will uh, your label is exp um, mandatory. You can also have, instead of having an if control structure and an exit inside of it, you can just do the exit or the continue with a when boolean expression, and then it will actually only do the exit or the continue when that thing evaluates is strictly true. All right, another loop we have is the while loop, and this will continue ex um running and iterating until that function returns strictly true. So that Boolean expression is evaluated on each iteration. So you can have a query in there to check something. Also, there's the caveat that if it never returns true, the while loop will just forever and ever and ever execute. Okay. We also have the basic for loop. There, this is just the basic for loop, for variable in numbers loop. All right. That loop variable will automatically be created and cr as a type of int, and it only exists within the loop. You can't reference it outside. Uh, that low and upper expressions are only evaluated once. So if you have variable, if you get it from a query or an execute statement, uh, that thing will only be executed once. So you can't change your upper bound in the loop. It will always just continue. And then that by clause that you see in the third query, that indicates the step. So if I say reverse 10 to 1, it will jump in steps of 2. Note that reverse uh, keyword there 
is necessary if you actually want to go backwards from a 10 to a 1. Otherwise, because what it does is it tries to, it assigns the lower bound to the variable and then as long as that variable is smaller than the, the upper bound, it will uh, loop. And if you don't have the reverse, the lower bound will be your leftmost one and the upper bound your rightmost one. Whilst if you do the reverse, it switches them around. Okay. All right. Then you can have the for in query. Uh, this is typically used to loop through query results where you have your target variable. If you, that query is executed and then that target variable will be assigned to each record or row inside, um, that is returned by that query. You can also have multiple variables actually co as common delimited values in the place of target and then it will assign, if you return a, uh, like a record with three fields, you can have three variables then each one will have the value of the, of the corresponding field in, positional, in a positional manner. All right. And then in that query, you can actually just use your uh, variables as is. You don't have to do a format or an execute or anything like that. And then this allows for the query plan to be cached so that your iterations are quicker and uh, makes use of Postgres's things. Then you can also use the for in execute with a text expression. This is typically used when you want to uh, have dynamic queries, uh, which can vary based on which, for instance, which table you want to loop through or those types of things. The, uh, you should note though that when you use the execute, it cannot cache the prepared plan that it um, did in the previous thing because it has to repass the query every single time it goes to the iteration. So this tends to lead to slower loops than in the previous example. All right, and there's just a little dull bit comic for the things. All right, you can also loop through arrays. All right, uh, the variables can also be comma separated lists, a, a comma separate li separated list, and then each variable will be assigned that corresponding value when looping through the array. Uh, slice actually doesn't indicate the amount of variables that you want, uh, the amount of values that you want in each loop, but the dimension of the array that you're looping through. So uh, we can have multi-dimensional arrays, and slice one indicates that we want those, the first uh, dimension. If you don't add a slice, it will actually loop through each of those elements itself. So if you don't have a slice in the example over there, it will not have row equals to one to three, it will be rows to one and then two, and then three, and then four. So it will lead to 12 iterations instead of four. Okay. And then, yes, I'm moving through these things. We have the concept of error handling in Postgres. Uh, so this is how you catch exceptions and, your, and w things that go weird in your, um, in your application. So, um, Typically, when things break, you, ex you, can you can actually catch exceptions. And there's a very, very long list of those on that at that link. Uh, you can catch when a table doesn't exist, when a foreign key uh, gets, uh, what do you call it? When you violate a constraint, uh, when you try to have a passing error, all types of things, there's out of memory exceptions. And then if you don't want to specify the actual exception, you can also say when others. And then the, you can end, catch every single exception that you want. All right. Um, the different exceptions that you can put on the when clause are actually, you can do the, it either by the SQL state code or by the name of the exception. Okay. Note though that um, this is not a fix it all block, uh, begin, except when others block. Um, because it, this is, it's significantly slower for Postgres to enter these types of blocks. And uh, so use it with caution. Typically, we would want this if you know of a specific case where you know it will might throw an error and you know how to handle it. But uh, yeah, this is all to do with proper exception handling practices and not yeah, proper exception handling practices. Not to catch all the exceptions and not doing anything because that is not a good idea. Right. When an exception is thrown, it is thrown to the upper scope. If you, if you don't have an exception handler, it throws it to the caller and all the way until, if it, until it finds an exception handler. If it doesn't find one, it will 
raise it and then you will get an actual error from PLPG SQL. You can also raise exceptions yourself by specifying that by saying raise and a message or with raising a specific specific SQL error code and then that will return that specific SQL message. Um, <coughs> is everyone still with me with this? Okay, that will be logged as a specific as the error level in your logs. Okay. Um, when you catch an exception, you can inspect the call stack actually to see what happened. So we have the two special variables, uh, SQL state and SQL error, uh, which is the error message. Uh, the SQL state is, to, is the error code, which is on that list that I um, showed you, and the error message is the actual text representation of the exception uh, that you get. You can get these things by calling the by running the get stacked diagnostics query and then having a variable and assigning it to uh, to one of these these variables over there. Okay. And you can see there's quite a lot of them that you get. You get the column name that triggered the exception, you can get the constraint name, the data type, the table name, the schema, and then a int is some the int is typically the one that says do you want to reference this column instead of another one when you and the context would be the the actual lines of text that errored. All right, um, the get stack to diagnostics uh, query statements are actually only available in an exception block because then it has all those those context. If you are, however, in a se uh, in a position where you want to find out where you are currently in your execution. Uh, context, you can run the get diagnostics query itself. So instead of get stacked diagnostics, it's get diagnostics. And this will return those, this will uh, um, give you those three variables, the row count, the result OID, and the PG context. All right. The row count is typically the, is the, is the number of rows that were processed by the last SQL command that you ran. So if you want to run a bunch of inserts or updates or selects and you want to know how many things I've updated, you can actually get the row count from this variable. The result OID is as ex explained there. The OID of the last row inserted and the PG context is exactly the same as in the exception case where you know your actual execution context. It will give you a stack trace of where you are in your functions. And uh, there's an example of how it calls. We have the outer function and we have the inner function, where the outer function just uh, returns the, ex uh, the result of the inner function. And the inner function, as a stack, it gets the diagnostics. And as you can see, it uses the stack variable and assigns the PG context to it. All right. And then it just notice, uh, raise an, uh, shows a, prints a message and returns one. And then if you call the outer function, you can see that uh, when the get got, when the raise notice happens, that is actually the contents of the PG context variable. Okay, and then you can see how it returns. And then here are all the links that I've had. We have the PLPG SQL one. This is I would very much suggest that you go and read the the documentation on especially the first link because it gives you a very broad overview on how. PLPG SQL parses queries, how the language actually works in the background, how to call things, how these statements work, caching, all those types of things. The second link is the list of all the error codes. I think there's there's really a lot of them. There's like 200 or so. And uh, the third link is just a, is a page that it includes an explanation of all the control structures that I showed you today. And then uh, all images have been sampled from Google Images. And I see I've been a bit, a bit hasty, very hasty. So if you have any questions at all, I'm open for you now. Kissing. Hi. Hi. Uh, your, thank you for your talk. It was quite interesting. There's two things that uh, I'd like to know about. Firstly, curses. All right. Does PG uh, PLSQL actually uh, require you to declare curses? And secondly, function overloading. How does uh, uh, 
uh, PLSQL deal with that. All right. With Cursor specifically, you don't have to declare your own, but you, you can. There's a link is, uh, right at the top link. There's a section specifically dedicated to Cursors because you can. And those are especially used in procedures instead of functions. But uh, you don't have to explicitly declare them. And then your seg uh, uh, function overloading. All right. So function overloading is when you declare a function with the same name, but you have different, uh, pr uh, different parameter lists. All right. PG PL PG SQL does support this, where you have the same name and you can have a uh, it can even have different lengths of uh, variable lists. However, and then the query planner, when you call the function, it will try to find the one that best suits the parameters that you give it, like text and integers and those types of things. But uh, if it finds that it's a bit ambiguous, it will raise an error. And then you have to explicitly cast it to the data type that the function expects. So if a function has a text uh, variable or and the overloaded function has a varchar variable, you have to cast it to the specific type to know exactly which one you want to call. Uh, this also, this then also, with the ambiguity, when you try to drop a function or you rep or replace a function or those types of stuff, you actually uh, and add comments to your functions with a comment on statement. You have to uh, ex be explicit about which function you want to replace or drop, and so otherwise it's not going to know. Postgres at least lets you know when is when it's confused. So yeah. All right. Any more questions? You sure. Um, yes. <coughs> record types. All right. So a uh, record type is. Uh, Hello. Uh, so just for the record, that you d cover record types, and if not, um, just maybe give okay. some context on record types. All right. So record types. Uh, it's a part of a. It's a composite type, similar to a row. Right, let me see, I have an example here of where the row type is actually used. Okay, now the big thing with records and rows is that they have, you call them, you access them in similar manners. You access them exactly as if they are table rows. So you would have row dot field name, row dot field name. Same with the record, record dot field name, dot field name. The difference is, is that a, a record can have a different structure different uh, variable structure throughout its lifetime. You don't have to declare the structure initially. So when you're looping through a, through a result set in a query, you can use a record and it will just assume the structure and then you can use that exact same variable and assign a different type of row to that. All right, so the structure is not fixed. With a row type, you actually specify that I want it to be like this. This is my type of row and it will always have these fields in it of these types. You declare it exactly the same as you declare a table when you create it. You would say this is a row with these fields of this type, this field of this type, this field of this type. And you can also declare a variable as the type similar to another table's row. So as you can see there where it says R at the declare uh, R is a foo percentage row type. It actually says I want my R variable to look exactly the same as a row would look in the foo table. So each, so R would always have a foo ID, uh, foo sub ID, and a foo name property. All right. And then when you return a set of, <coughs> when your function declares that it returns a set of something, here you can see it returns a set of foo, meaning I return a set of rows that look like the foo table. With records, you have to say I return a set of a record that looks like this. You have to be explicit. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Sorry, it was a bit. It was a bit fast. I was a bit stressed today. But yeah, if you have any other questions, come talk to me, and then. Go and go and read the documentation. It's very useful. It's very, it's very in detail.